How's it going, man? Good. Good. Nice to be on your talk show. Thanks very much. You're officially the first one to uh, break in the virginity of the Maverick <laughs> talk show. I love that. Thank you. I feel honored. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, you've recently had a lot of shit with your social media. Someone hacked into your accounts, yeah. basically took over your entire persona. Do you want to run us through exactly what happened? Yeah, so it was on a Friday and um, just after training, I usually have a meal and I'm sitting in front of my computer and I got an email saying that you requested to change your password. I didn't take it very seriously. It was a proper Instagram email. Well, it looked proper. And the next thing I got an email stating that you your password has success, successfully been changed. So the first thing that I went was on my phone. I went to Instagram and my profile was gone. I was locked out. And then I received the email saying that you have just requested to change your password on Facebook and exactly the same thing happened. But long story short, yeah, so all of my uh, accounts have been hacked, which is Instagram, personal Facebook page, my Facebook fan page, Twitter, and Snapchat. Which ones have you managed to get back so far? Um, after a big struggle, I received all my pages back except Twitter. Twitter is gone because what he did, he changed my handle and they can't help me unless I know what they changed it to, which, to be honest, is I think it's a bit ridiculous when it comes to Twitter. But uh, I also did a lot of research on internet, and I think a lot of people have been struggling with Twitter and the customer service. So what's the first thing that went through your mind? I mean, you you live on social media, your career is based on social media. What's the first thing that went through your mind? I know you were at a boot camp with your kids on that weekend specifically, yeah. and you were trying to enjoy a bit of family time, but at the same time, you knew this big thing was going on in your life. I remember my hands were in my hair and I was jumping up and down, freaking out. Um, I, I literally had an anxiety attack, I think, because it's my life. It's what I do, it's where my income comes from, all my sponsors. Um, I just signed that massive um, campaign as a KOL ambassador for Huawei, South Africa, and um, it was really a big deal for me, and not just that, you know, I also, you know, a massive wake-up call, realizing that, wow, this, that my whole life depends on, on social media. But it doesn't end there, because what happened was, you know, normally someone gets hacked, and it's a bit of a joke, and someone's yeah. sitting behind a keyboard, and they've taken over your life, and that's the, sort of the, the end result, but then it didn't stop there for you, yeah. did it? So he immediately changed his name to Mustafa Jokovic, or something like that. With your picture? With his picture. With his picture. So he changed all the profile pictures, but it all still said Yaku the Brain. Uh, you, can't, you can't change a name on Instagram or s Facebook without a process. But um, nonetheless, he, he changed. I queried it. I've sent it to Facebook. Facebook takes about 24 hours to, to respond. You know, I tried everything in my power to get it back immediately, which didn't happen. And... Um, we went onto the boot camp. I was there for a few hours. Felt really bad. The only thing that was on my mind was was my business and social media. So I told my wife, like, I can't be here. I need to go back. Got back home, and I um, got an email from Facebook stating that um, I need to send them a photo with my, of my face and a paper with a, a like an OTP pin that you must write on there and my full names and my handles. So I've sent it to Facebook, they approved it and they immediately gave me access to Facebook. So I went onto settings, tried to change everything and um, change the password and the email address and immediately that guy changed it back. So it was an ongoing process. I was literally like fighting this guy for four hours. Was this before or after he actually communicated with you? Uh, not communicated with me. After the four hours, nothing happened. He hasn't changed it back and then he sends me a message on my personal number, WhatsApp stating that he wants money and the number was from turkey the part that pissed me off the most was the fact that he started threatening you saying you know i know the names of your children and yes. things like that and for me i mean that's obvious news to everybody let's yeah. be honest because you're you don't just put fitness on social media you put your whole life on social yeah. media what was he saying in it's particular scary. with respect to your your kids names because that really upset me when i heard that he didn't threaten them at all. He just said that he he knows he, he wrote a message stating their names, um, and my wife he knows he, he sees my kids Kiana Rico on social media, and um, if I want all these memories back, I need to pay him a, a long sum of money. 
but I never responded to to any of the WhatsApp messages. So there was no aggressive then, threat at all. No. You just wanted money. And the next for day, he just sends me question marks <laughs> because I didn't respond to his WhatsApp messages. Cheeky fucker. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So there was there was we had a conversation in Google Translate where I obviously, you know, got really upset. and Because he he's writing to you in Turkish. He's writing t- in Turkish. And yes. you have no idea what's coming through so the I phone. So I did a translation, and then that's where I saw the kids' names, and um, it, it was a kid. I think the guy that hacked the accounts was probably like 19, 20 years old. With nothing better to do with his time than, yeah. than uh, create havoc and just... But um, Facebook was really helpful. They phoned me on the Monday, and I explained the whole situation to them. By the, that Thursday, almost a week later, I got all my accounts back. Facebook phoned me again, um, said that they caught the guy. They can't give me any informa- information because it's not their department, but they just want to say that everything is now secure and I need to do the two-fact authentic- authentication. And yeah, ever since then, all my social media has gone down. I think on Instagram, I lost in that week probably about 6,000 followers. And they re- I don't, to be honest, I don't really know why. Um, but email Facebook again, and they said just, they froze all my accounts, and they completely threw me out of the algorithm. And it'll take me a bit of time to to come back. But now, yeah, it's growing again, and I'm happy. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, growing up as a child, I know I've I've also been privileged to spend some time with your family. You come from a fantastic Afrikaans family. Thank you. Um, obviously, getting into fitness. You know, was it was it any idea of yours towards the end of your school career mm-hmm. that you might be going towards the fitness industry? Uh, I know you went to the UK. You got some great stories to tell us there. <laughs> one of which I can't wait for you to tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, so, around matric, you decide you wanted to take a gap year, and then you you disappeared to the UK. Yeah. You can tell the story from there. So. Um I wanted to go overseas for a year. I had no idea what I wanted to do after school. I didn't. I, 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 we d- I didn't come from a very wealthy family. We, you know, we were very normal, brought up kids. You know, but there wasn't a lot of money in in our house, and um, so I I couldn't go to university that year. Although I had access to to university, I just said Let, I want to go overseas and just have a gap year, and. Um, Went overseas to work in a hotel just underneath Scotland. What did you do in the hotel? I was a waiter. Um, I worked in the restaurant. I did a bit of bar work. Uh, worked for a salary, but we stayed in a staff block behind the hotel. You actually met your wife in that hotel, didn't you? Yes. So there was about, if I correct, uh, remember correctly, about 15 South Africans there. So it was, you know, that was still the time when you can get a two-year working working holiday visa to go work overseas in the UK. But I met my wife there um, 18 years later, two beautiful boys. Um, But yeah, it was literally, you know, for me, I just wanted to find my feet there. Um, I became very independent, made my own money, um, traveled quite a bit. I think that's where my love for traveling came from. But did you spend more time in Scotland or in England? It wasn't in Scotland, it was in Cumbria, but it's right on the border of, of Scotland. Okay. Um, Windermere, where the Lake District is. Then my wife visa expired, she, uh, she went back and I had another year on my visa and that's when I w- moved to London to do security works in Harrods and Selfridge, Selfridges. Um, <clears throat> worked there for about a year, so I ended up almost three and a half years in the UK. You ever have any incidents while you're doing security work? I mean, you're not you're not an aggressive guy. You're not a confrontational guy. Yeah, not many that I can remember, but there was quite. It was a basic was stuff like a, theft and just theft, and, and, yeah, of people stealing perfume or you know small items, but nothing serious. And did anyone? But it, but it was long hours, twelve hour shifts. Um, and did anyone resist, Yaku? No. <laughs> anyone try bolt for the door? <laughs> I was probably the skinniest guy ever, so I don't think I'll ever have survived any incident. Did you have the whole earpiece uh, coming, coming, Delta, Delta, Roger, Roger? I had all of that, yeah. It Did was, you? It was exciting. Someone just stole some perfume <laughs> coming over. But yeah, it was an exciting time of, of my life. And, um, you know, I fell a bit off the wagon, partying and... You know, did all the stuff that youngsters do. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to say, now you've got to tell us the story yeah. about you in London, in London experimenting with the mushrooms. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> 
Yeah, it was quite I've exciting. Sto- we were on the train and um, all the colours just became so bright and everything was like so different. And, and I remember climbing off the tube and um, wanting to go to the toilet and there was this mom taking a baby out of the pram and going into the bathrooms. Do you remember which station you were at? Or you it was on the red line. By that stage, you didn't even know. Line, didn't even know what country you were in by that stage. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I thought it's a great opportunity to steal the pram. And um, say it like it is, Yaku. You stole the pram. I stole the pram. And what did you do with the pram for the rest of the day? I walked around London with the pram. <laughs> and, the, and pushing it, and um, ended up home, went to bed, and the next time when I woke up, the pram was in the house, and I was like, what the hell is this now, pram doing? <laughs> I'm going to ask the question that everyone that's watching this is dying to ask. Did you first check that the baby was not in the pram? Yeah, no, I knew the baby was in the pram. <laughs> because I saw the mom take the baby out. So then you walked around London the whole day with a pram. With a pram. You went home. Went home, next day I woke up, and there was a pram in the house, and I was like, what the hell is this pram doing in the house? And all my friends told me that I pitched up with, and then all the memories just came back, and I was like, what the So what did you do with the pram? I was just pushing it, having fun. No, what did you do with it when you woke up the next morning and realized you had a pram? And then? Someone took it. (laughs) (laughs) Someone someone took it to the second-hand pram shop and sold it for 50 pounds. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, that was the exciting time of my life. And, um, you know, I, I became very responsible of being independent. And, you know, I say responsible now, but, you know, we, we learned a lot of lessons in the UK, that's for sure. Okay. And then the the best thing is met, meeting my wife there. And then at what stage did you come to South Africa and start sort of getting involved in fitness? How, does that, how did that work out? 2004, came back to South Africa. Um, went to study property specialist. I did my NQF level three, four and five through UNISA, where I did property specialist and business management. Um, were you still convinced at that time that that was something that you wanted to do or were you, was I, it just a matter of? I actually studied law first, LLB, and I hated it. And then I changed my subjects to business management and property. Um, did property for five years and I absolutely hated it. it my heart and soul was just never in it. Was there any pressure from your family after matric to, to get a job, get an education? Because, I mean, I went through that. Look, I'm a couple of years older than you, and my parents are obviously a lot more old school. But there was that, there was a lot of pressure on, on you know, you've got to go to university or you've got to go to college. You've got to become something that's going to make money. And I think that, that actually creates a bit of a setback. And I'm glad you mentioned that you actually took a gap year. I would have loved to have taken a gap year because I chose, straight after school, I chose just to go into a career and obviously it's not something I'm doing today. So I think I think there's um, a time it takes and, and an evolution of time that it takes to actually figure out what it is you want to do. I don't think my parents, they always wanted me to, to study, but they never really pushed me in any direction or forced me to. I think from a very young age, I was always um, determined to to be successful and wanting to achieve something, you just even had though, to, even though just I had didn't find, know what it was. You just had to find that just passion to for find something so you could put all your energy into it. I in anything that w- came my way. Um, then you came home. Came South home, Africa. I started studying and decided to go the modeling route. It wasn't fitness modeling it at first, fitness, was it? No, it was just pure um, modeling, ramp modeling, um, magazines, photo shoots. Um, what made you think you had a thing for modeling? Did you just fancy yourself? Or, or, yeah, so you know? I, had this, I, I had this phone call from this lady that owned Mr. Pretoria, Mr. and Mrs. Pretoria, and she was a fr- follower on Facebook. I say follower now, but, or a friend. But um, asked me to, if I'm interested in entering Mr. Pretoria. And I was like, no, I've never done anything like this in, in my life. but. Yeah, another challenge thrown my way, and I thought, well, let's give this a try. All at the tender weight of? How much did you weigh? 75. 75 kilos. Yeah. Were you training then? No, not really. I got married in 2007, so that's when that's when my modeling career started. Okay. Um, so, in a nutshell, did Mr. Pretoria, uh, won Mr. Pretoria 2008 and then automatically entered into Mr. South Africa. Now in this time frame, 
Um, I did a lot of modeling work for magazines and small little competitions. And between 2008, 9 and 10, I won Model of the Year South Africa. You're talking about fashion magazines fashion, and things yeah. like that. Okay. Fashion, yeah. So I did a lot of ramp modeling as well, um, SA Fashion Week, and um, worked with a lot of fashion designers. Um, my first underwear shoot, um, <laughs> there was, um, you saw, I think you saw. <laughs> Pictures of you in your underwear. You put well, it. You put it. You put it up all the time on Tuesday. On Tuesday, you can expect to see a photo of Yaku de Brain. And uh, oh, look at this on the left, you've wonder, got on the left, you've got this kid in his underpants, and then you, on the right, you've got this world class fitness model. You yeah. know? Ah, we had to start somewhere. But anyway, so into didn't want to do Mr. South Africa because I did a bit of research, and all the winners were over thirty five or in the. Um, early 30s to 35 and I was only 26 at the time and um, I remember going to my dad and said listen I really want to do this but all these guys are over 30 and I don't think um, I'll be able to to pull this off and my dad said to me that I have to remember that age is just a number and you can do whatever you want as, as long as you put your mind to it. It's great that you had some good encouragement from your folks, especially going into this kind of arena, be it modeling or fitness modeling. I think a lot of a lot of men, especially Afrikaans, boys, you know, come up against a lot of resistance from their fathers when they want to when they want to venture into fitness or they want to venture into modeling. I don't th- I don't quite think their family understands that they can make a career out of it. And they see it as a bit of a sort of a taboo kind of industry rather than a real career orientated industry. Never, never made money in that four or five years that I did, did modeling. It was purely just passion and I think I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. But today, a lot of that has helped me so much to, to my success that I've achieved today. So um, I did Mr. South Africa, which is a year campaign. We have to do a lot of um, charity work, raising money, being involved in the community. Um, a ton of appearances. Building a, pr- a profile for yourself. And, yeah. You know, I went all out. I raised a shitload of money. I think 150,000 rand. And that goes straight back to the whole Mr. South Africa so, yeah. fund and then they distribute for the charities. Or well, you'd like uh, to think they did? We'd like to think that, yeah. There was a lot of stories in, on carte blanche and all the news with, when it comes to Mr. South Africa. But nonetheless, it was a great experience for me. But um, I placed second. And I think that was the biggest disappointment for me ever. And, um, and I remember going to, to the judges, asking them why I didn't win. Obviously, I had an expectation that I was going to win. You know, they had all these voting polls and, you know, all my votes were higher than everybody else's, but I didn't win. But I also look back at it now and when I look at the video, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I understand what I, I'll never forget the question they asked me when there was a top five on stage. So they went from 50 to 30 to 15 and then 10 do, does the actual show and then they pick the top five and then each in the top five would get an answer. And I'll never forget the question they asked me on stage. What did they ask? So you draw a name and one of the judges asks you a question and they said, Yaku. So if you had to win Mr. South Africa 2009, how would you convince South Africa that you were the right choice? And my mind went Afrikaans, translating in English. <laughs> on top. At, at least they didn't ask you what your favorite dish was and you popped up Tupperware or something like that. <laughs> but um, so I went uh, uh, and started talking and trying to explain and then I lost it completely and I went and yeah and that was the end of my career and <laughs> yeah <laughs> just because there you go there's the answer <laughs> but um, play second there and it was it was a big disappointment for me but um, I remember the next day there was a lady phoning me and I, I, I till today I don't know who she was and where she came from but she phoned me and she said to me that she was at the show and she could see that I was very disappointed and she just wants to tell me that there's going to be bigger things for me and there's going to be there's a reason why I didn't win because it would have locked me down for a year where I could not enter anything else and still to this day you don't know who that person was I don't know who that person was no I don't know whether or not that person was part of Ms. Mr. SA or but um yeah so a year later and I say yeah yeah <laughs> a year later or in that year when um Mr. What was it? Steven Seagal was the winner. They phoned. 
I entered Manwatch, which is a heat magazine competition based also in South, South, South Africa. And that's when I really, well, I started training for Mr. SA and just wanted to look good. And then I entered this torso competition, tra started training harder. And because um, that was a big thing, that heat, that heat competition was big and that lasted for a couple of years. It had some great momentum. And there were a lot of guys entering. And it, 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 I got more exposure from that than Mr. Issa because Media 24 was involved. Let's get into talking about training. So you started training a little bit for these pageants and things you were doing. You wanted to look better. Where did it go from there? Always had this passion since I was a kid to about bodybuilding and fitness athletes looking good. Um, and um, yeah, I was just never happy in the property. So I remember Rudy phoned me one day and said, no, he, he's selling a store, would I be interested in a supplement store? Not knowing anything about the industry whatsoever, or supplements. But um, I felt at that stage that it would be a great opportunity for me to put my feet into the, it will be a step into the industry. And you're already growing a passion for training at this time, yes. getting to know the industry, so... Okay. So body started to changing slowly but surely after the Heat magazine competition and... Um, so, yeah, so I, I just took all the money that I had and um, bought into Rudy's business that time. Me and Rudy worked together for a while and then sold him out. You obviously brought quite a bit of money back from the UK because that was why you were yeah. there over the years, saving yeah. money. And I made a bit of money back. with the property. Okay. Um, so I bought his, I can't even remember, Mac Nutrition, and then I changed it to Jar Nutrition. I've never asked you, but where did Jar come from? So Jar was, we were three partners, which was Yaku, Andrew, and Rudy. Okay, Jar. And then we sold all, so I sold all of them, all of them sold their shares to me, and I was the, the sole owner, and I just kept Jar. I'm actually still using Jar Nutrition today. Okay. Um, but yeah, then, you know, in the store every single day, on YouTube, watching all these celebrity athletes like Sergi Constance, Ulysses, Simeon Panda, um, all these athletes that inspired me and it just driven me so much that I, you know, I wanted to, to do this fitness thing. So I started training really hard and um, I remember there was a show called Body Beautiful, which people suggested to me and said, no, I must do the show. Did a bit of research and I said, okay, I'm just going to prep myself and to Body Beautiful 2011. That was my very first show that I don't had this red shorts on. Um, you, still, you still put up that picture on social yes. media to this day yeah. saying it was some of your best conditioning yeah. ever. So did that show, pitched up at the show, didn't know anybody from a bar of soap. A few people knew me because of my modeling career in Mr. South Africa, but I didn't know, I was just this, new kid on the block that entered the fitness show and I won that year, uh, Mr. Physique. And some of those photos went viral over the internet, especially the back photo. And um, there was a lot of forums on bodybuilding.com and all these big pages wanting to know who is this guy. Very similar to what happens to all these new athletes, you know, and two on two like Regan and Grimes. And, you know, they, they hot on the chart at the moment, but it's purely because of photos of them that went viral. But um, got all this attention from international websites that wanted to do an interview of me, especially um, Simply Shredded from Australia, which was at that time one of the biggest um, bodybuilding websites in the world. So when they featured you, it gave you a massive boost? Insanely. I, I think just after the feature on um, simplyshredded.com, I, I received like 1,000 to 1,500 followers a day. Um, I invested a lot of time in my social media from a very early stage, even when Instagram just started. So a lot of pressure was put on me for the next year of pressure that I've put on myself because I've got all the attention now and I, you know, I wanted to stay on top of my game. And then I did Body Beautiful 2012 again in my green pants. And that was by far the best conditioning to date. I think that's the shot that you're always putting up every now and then saying, yeah. you know, that was your favorite condition. And after that, it was people, all these people that approached me a year before, it was just more websites that wanted to do interviews with me. Um, I think from that year onwards, I already got invites to go overseas. Um, 
and do what compete or just re- be represent at brands yeah represent brands and be at expos and people really wanted to I, I was starting to build up a fan base internationally and um, all these people just messaging me say am I going to FIBO am I going to Body Power so all these and a lot of people don't understand that today is all these shows fitness expos you know I, I use my own money to to go network and build my name and brand outside South Africa I think that's the big difference between current day and previous day people who are up and coming in this in this industry is you actually took your own money finance yourself to be overseas to be in the people's faces people that had the influence mm. that could assist you to grow a following whereas there's a lot of guys today that are sort of sitting around going oh i need a sponsor mm. you know and they're not doing anything about being at events they're not doing anything about yeah. being in the eyes of or even active on social media or even active on social media but mainly being next to the people that can actually see that they've got some marketability and some character mm. and actually possibly use them within their brands yeah and uh, taking photos with all these people that are already influencers overseas and all those vir- photos went viral and it, people start relating to you and knowing who you are because you affiliate yourself with top international athletes so that that really helped me a lot how many magazine covers have you had to date? Um, six. Which is your favorite? Careful now. <laughs> um, probably my very first one, I would say. And then um, my first international cover, which was South America. That was the Muscle and Fitness? Muscle and Fitness, yes. Shot by Jason Ellis. Jason Ellis. Jason Ellis. And then my second international cover, uh, also Jason Ellis in the Netherlands. And then I've got three with you. Would you say Jason's probably one of your favorite guys to shoot with from a, from a magazine cover perspective? Um, I shot with probably every single international photographer and all of them got their own look and feel. But when it comes to, to magazines, I would definitely suggest and say that Jason is the best. You mentioned earlier that you used to look up to the likes of Sergi Constance. I mean, you became really good friends with Sergi. Mm-hmm. You you guys went in business together. You've traveled the world together. Mm-hmm. Sergi's got some crazy stories. I mean, that guy gets followed wherever he goes. Yeah, um, it, it was so surreal for me to, to meet him, especially, and um, getting w- along so well. And the thing is where I think I added a lot of value to Sergi is when it comes to the language barrier because you know, I had a lot of people that wanted to invest in me internationally where Sergi also, but there was, he just couldn't communicate. And um, me and Sergi just got along so well that I wanted to pull him in and say, listen, let's do something together. And we had big trust with in our circle. And that's when myself and Sergi started the international clothing man called Aesthetics Era. How much attention does Sergi actually get when you walk around an expo? Oh, it's crazy. It's surreal. I um, mean, you get a lot of attention, okay? But Sergi, Sergi's on a whole new gets, level, especially gets, amongst ladies. He gets raped. He gets raped, <laughs> literally. Um, it's hard for him to walk in a is, straight line at an is, expo. It's so weird to see that the amount of attention he gets. And I think it's, it's a lot to do with his look. He obviously got a, you know, amazing physique. Um, but yeah, the, you know, we've, we've shared rooms together with his girls, <laughs> where I'm just in bed and he has a guitar. <laughs> but that's how life was. <laughs> we, um, you know, when we go overseas and people book us, we usually stay in the same room and he, he's got no scum. But, but I mean, um, you, you also get the same attention. I know you're of a completely different mindset. You know, yeah. you, you, you're married with kids and, you, and I know for a fact you're not that way inclined at all. Yeah. But I mean, you also get a lot of attention when you go overseas. And I mean, what are some of the girls come up to you and and, and say to you at expos? Are some of them sort of like quite suggestive or some of them just really direct? Yeah, some of them, especially Europe. um, I I found it when there's a bit of a language barrier that the girls tend to throw themselves at you much more than girls that actually understand like British or English girls or American girls. I think there's a bit more they try and be more polite but with the other girls in Europe it's they like literally throw themselves at you and for me you know I'll take it up to a stage where I'm like okay now it's a bit too much and then I get scared so <laughs> I just pull pull away 
I always laugh at the story you once told me. You came back from an expo. I can't remember which one it was. Um, I think it was FIBA. And you'd taken a photo with Larissa Race. And she is world-renowned. I mean, she's a very famous fitness model. I think she just became a mom recently. I've seen on um, Instagram. But she, she put her arm around you and you took a photo. And obviously no one knows the history behind the photo. But then you came back and you showed me the photo. And you said to me, Straight after this photo was taken, she sort of... Yeah, she got to speak like me. Um, I was standing in a queue like any other fanboy and um, wanted to take a photo of her. And um, when she saw me, she like, oh, no, 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 come. What? Is she Russian or... or um, I'm not actually sure what nationality she is. But she called me to, uh, to stand and said, no, no, I want to take a photo of you. She's got quite a... a husky voice. Husky, deep voice. And um, she took a photo and she was putting her arm next, putting her arm next to mine, and she said, "Oh, you're so nice." <laughs> 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 and her voice just scared me off. I was like, "What the hell is happening?" <laughs> and she was ten times the size of me. <laughs> She's a big girl. I think instead of asking you um, which countries have you been to i'm going to ask you which countries have you actually not been to because you've been to so many countries and you've traveled on so many planes yeah. and what do you say which would you say is your favorite favorite trip so far i mean obviously vegas is always a great yeah. place to go i think all all of the countries got a different vibe and a different feel but the countries that i took to heart was definitely the poor countries egypt india some of the middle eastern countries you know it was a big eye opener to see and to realize how much we actually take for granted. I'm glad you mentioned India. You, you know, I've been to India twice. Um, we were looking at opening a Muscle Evolution magazine in India a while back, oh, which which fell through. It was just I don't know, it was just an impossible nightmare to mm. get things going there. But I'm so glad that I made those two trips. Yeah. You know, and I think that India is something we could do an entire podcast on alone. I mean, mm. you come back from India a completely different person, you know, whether you're religious or not. Okay. If there's a spiritual side to you, you'll come back from India a completely changed person. And I know you've been a few times and yeah, it, every time you come back, you always tell me how, how humbling and how, how appreciative you are of life because of the fact that you've traveled to a place like India. I've been to India, India four times, and the last time I've been there, I've traveled, I've been there for three weeks, and I've traveled nine cities over the three weeks. We're literally on a plane every single day. And um, I saw some horrific things and that, you know, you don't even want to talk about it. But non, take that aside and just what I love about the country so much is they are beautiful people, their hearts and their souls, they're so... Uh, they welcome you with open arms. When it comes to fans, they are crazy. Oh my when they yeah. see celebrities yeah. or they see people of influence, they go absolutely crazy. Yeah. Whether you're in the street, whether you're on a stage, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah, we were, we were, uh, th for me, that was probably the most surreal thing I've ever experienced in my life. Like, I, you can't even go to the toilet and people, like, I had literally eight security guards having a, do like, a donut around me just to go pee. Because um, they have no they clue all, of social space or nothing, personal yeah. space. But they, they know you they, and they all knew me by name and they, they shout your name and yeah, we want to take a photo and it was it's crazy. Like I literally felt like a celebrity there. <laughs> it's crazy. The but one? Um, yeah, we stayed in probably some of the most beautiful hotels I've ever stayed in the whole world in, in India. And um, you know, if you, one thing that I've learned is like I've tagged myself into a hotel and the next moment you think there's, there's like 4,000 people in there. And reception wanting to meet you so you yeah, never tack yourself into a towel that's for sure <laughs> the one thing about you traveling so much and obviously keeping up appearances is that you're away from your family how does that affect you i think it was hard harder for my wife and it was also hard for me because my kids were still very young but i also knew that an opportunity like this is not going to come again and um, i was i was spoiled when it comes to having opportunities to travel the entire world and getting paid for it. Um, but there was many times that I was on the plane and I cried and I was like, what the hell am I doing? What am I doing here? Yeah. Is, this, is this the right thing to do? Um, but yeah, my wife understood and you know, if there's one thing between me and Renata is that we, we communicate and we've got an open relationship and we, 
you know, we know exactly where we stand with each other. And I think that's the important key when it comes to being away from home so much. Which would you say is your favorite country? <sighs> to travel to, I would probably say Australia. Okay, you enjoyed Australia? I love Australia, yeah. Look, being in the limelight, you get to meet a lot of people. You also get a lot of people, especially on the South African circuit, that sort of want to latch on to you and, and sort of feed off that kind of success. You've also been very disappointed by people in the past, you know, which, which I'm glad to say hasn't changed you in any way. You know, you're still a great guy. You're still a humble guy. And you're still always prepared to help people as well, anyone that needs, needs advice and that. But I think you've learned along the way that not everyone is your friend and and certain people come into your life and you can immediately feel that they're just trying to leverage off you i mean yeah, you know, i wouldn't say immediately um but uh i've got that personality where i do give a bit of myself too fast and um i have learned the hard way even with friends that has been in my life for very long that has changed because i don't think people you know we all share the same passion and um, I've had that conversation with, with, with somebody recently. We, we all share the same passion. Some of them even compete way more than I've competed ever. And I don't think they, they understand why I always get to do what I do. And um, that's when things start to get sour. And I think people, be, I don't know, I, like it's hard for me to, to answer that question. But I, I have been hurt by a lot of good people, a lot of good friends that I thought was good friends in my life. But... Um, also had to go through that to realize that, you know, not everybody is there to to be with me as a person than rather than me as a friend. Uh, friend, yeah. The thing I want to touch on is something you actually just touched on, and that is that I think a lot of people equate success in shows to success in career, and it doesn't work that way. I mean, maybe it worked that way back in the 80s and the 90s when the guys were winning top shows and they were being put on the front covers of magazines. These days with social media, it's a completely different ballgame. You look at the top female or most marketable or most popular fitness girls on Instagram these days. Some of them have maybe competed once or twice in their life. Other than that, it's all about keeping up appearances and being marketable. I think there is that misconception between competing and have to win uh, in order to create success, which I feel is completely untrue. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think I think there's there's way more now when people ask me, um, you know, how have I reached my success, and I, I would tell them that f it's probably five percent of competing is what made me where I am today. The rest is is more about marketing myself, building relationships, networking, traveling, um, being an entrepreneur, and coming up with so many new ideas, and especially you know me in the clothing, bringing the I always wanted to have my foot into the fitness industry, but I always, I, w I was always thinking about more than just stepping on stage and being a competitive athlete. What do you say? What would you say is the dark side to the fitness game? You know, a lot of people see the success. I always like to sort of put out the picture there, the iceberg, you know, floating along the ocean. You only get to see sort of the top piece. But below, there's all this mass of ice, which is the hard work and the career establishment and the, the people and the connections and the, just the, the work that you've had to put in to build up to your, your career where you are today. What would you say is the dark side of the fitness game? Um, I would say probably social media because I don't think people realize the amount of work that I've actually put into into social media and a lot of people would always think the worst well oh, you've bought followers or you know you whatever the case may be but when you talk about the tip of the iceberg and this big rock underneath the ocean that people don't see and you know when I tell people my story but what I've done way before even the fitness what we spoke about now and I show them my, I've, I've got a little book that I've had every single newspaper article about myself, every single um, magazine insert that I've been in, um, all my videos, TV interviews, talk shows, everything on one CD. And when I show this to the people, they're like, wow, I never knew that about you. People don't see the work it takes to yeah, get to the don't. level you've reached. Um, but to come to answer your question with the dark side, you know, social media is, sometimes I'm like, fuck. 
Mm. I wish I just had a normal life and didn't have have social media in my life because it's 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 draining and I think a lot of people only see the good look I don't want to put something on social media which is negative and bad but you know we're all human but you can't put that on social media and I think that's when when people when you start learning about who that individual is then there's way more than what you know I've always see. said I've always said a lot of people even ask me they say how can I use social media to boost my career and promote myself, you know, so that I can maybe get a sponsor or become part of a brand? And I always like to take this exact situation as social media. This is the social media right here, this microphone, okay? The nine inches from here to here is the content generation, okay? And basically, at the end of the day, this has no emotion. This, has, this can't tell you what to do. It can't guide you. You can only guide yourself. And I think social media is like a microphone to people's characters. And if you're not putting good positive content out there and you're creating a bit of a negative vibe, it doesn't reflect well on you as a, as a marketable individual. And that's something I try to drill into people over and over again, but a lot of people don't seem to get it. You, you get it because obviously you've got the following, mm. you've got the people behind you, you know, that are helping you grow your career. Yeah, I think um, especially now there's a, a lot of people cause got the misperception of what what social media is about and you know, if you've got a big following you'll get all these sponsors and it's nothing like that. I think if you, and I've made a post about it last night where there's two things that you should be and this will take you very far in life and that is being authentic and humble. And I do believe that I've always been that and it's helped me a lot in my career um, obviously, I had a lot of setbacks, I had a lot of failures when it comes to especially business, but I always kept going and, you know, it's all of that is part of creating who you are. I think the authenticity is really important because people get to see that you're also human. Mm -hmm. You're not just posting your successes, you're posting your failures, you're posting your disappointments. And people can relate to that, mm -hmm. especially those that aspire to be on the same level you are. And when it comes to content, you know, you've... you've You've talked about it. Content is extremely important, and as, if there are people out there that wants to be successful, you have to take time to create content. But the thing that I want you to discuss is that as much as people are following you because you got a great physique, or maybe that was the initial reason why they joined your Instagram because they really enjoy looking at your physique, you can't just think that posting great content is posting a great physique shot. You've got to be giving more. You've got to be showing people how they can possibly get the physique, how you eat, mm -hmm. how you're training. Give you know, and a lot of people, especially here in South Africa, are not giving off that kind of content, mm -hmm. which inevitably means that they lose the follower because all they're doing is merely posting pictures of themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 hard work. That's I'm not gonna lie. Um, but if you wanna if you wanna keep people interested, you have to give. You have to give them something in return, and that's not it's whether or not it's about your diet or your life or you know advice, being a mentor. Um, all of these things play a huge role and it's, uh, you know, a lot of, I'm also where I am today for a lot of people that help me, um, helping me on the right path and telling me what to do and what not to do. It's, you know, it's all part of the journey. What do you think are some of the mistakes you've made on social media over the years? I mean, you, you can only learn by making mistakes and I think a lot of people are too scared to make mistakes, but you've done it all. What are some of the mistakes you've made? I think the biggest one was the John Meadows incident. incident. Um, where I, it was the year when my name went viral and did extremely well, I got all this attention and um, immediately had people wanting to work with me and I had this production company that said, listen, yeah, let's immediately now, if, w w while the heat is hot, let's write an ebook. And um, like, <laughs> I made a very, I admit my fault and um, it, it was a very impulsive decision and very, like, I didn't know what I was doing. It wasn't something where I was maliciously trying to, to steal content from, from John. But um, I've worked with John, I worked with John's program for a year and it's helped me a lot building my physique, not knowing that was a John Meadows program, just saying, I didn't even know who John Meadows was. But, um, so I had my own ebook, a lot of the stuff I wrote myself and I took a lot of John Meadows stuff and put it, copied exactly word for word as is into my... So it's not like you went onto his website and you just kind of scrolled no. over everything and no, copied not at all. Not at all. Like 
like true prop i didn't know john meadows was but i used exactly some of his work into copied it exactly like that into my ebook my ebook launched and um, i've emailed my first week for free to a shitload of database and somebody obviously knew the program and sent that to john meadows and this thing went viral and john meadows wanted to sue me and it was I remember that it erupted. Yeah, How long ago was that? It erupted quite badly. Four years. Four years. Uh, maybe even more. Did you manage to smooth it over quite quickly? So immediately knew what I was, what I did. Um, what do you call the word in English? Plagiarism. Plagiarism. Immediately knew what I did, and um, sent him a message on Facebook and said, "Please, please, 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 can I Skype with you?" And he said, "Yes, no problem." So I Skyped with him. He didn't want to do face to face. He didn't want to talk. He wanted to type, which. God, thank God today that, and I've just signed with EHP Labs that year, so it's four years ago. <coughs> but anyway, what he wrote, he was like nailing me to the T, and I was so sincere and apologetic, and I was like, I'm so sorry for what I've done, and you know, I admit, and it, I, I meant no harm. But he was like, the, how he spoke to me, and how was he accepting, or was he just angry? No, he didn't accept anything. He just wanted to sue the shit out of me. Where, but, where did it end up? So um, he mailed WBFF to take my pro card away from me. He mailed EHP Labs to take my sponsorship away from me. And um, luckily I've met all these per- people personally and they, they also know who I am as an individual. And I explained to them, my side from the story, I also said that, listen, yeah, I know what I've done and I'm sorry. So I'm, I, I apologize to John Meadows on all social media platform. And uh, yeah, it, for, for about six months, I got a lot of hate. It was, it was hard, it was hard to, to come back from that. However, I still, my career still grew rapidly and I still was invited to all the fitness expos, always very nervous walking into John Meadows. But today, you know, I look back and I'm like, it's, it had to happen to me. It, I think it kept me grounded. Um, I had to go through all of this, but that was probably my biggest setback. And then when it comes to business, you know, starting something and allowing other people to manage or to build something that is your vision that is something that that i've also learned and being part of a business that you have built but you don't owe more than 50 percent of the of the shares giving too much power giving too much power for somebody else and that's the saddest thing that i've learned with aesthetics era and um, because I, without a doubt, would say that that brand would not be where it is today if it wasn't for me. And it's doing pretty well now. What do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that South African guys are making? I mean, like if we could, if we could wrap up with encouragement for the South African community, obviously us being based in South Africa, we want to see more people like yourself up and coming on the international circuit, being made you know, top brand ambassadors for some really great brands overseas. How do you think the South African social media mentality needs to change in order for some of those guys to boost themselves into the international arena? Well, the first two things is what we spoke about is being authentic and humble and also not being narrow-minded, have tunnel vision. Think more outside of the box where you we have a vision, where you, you want to not just compete as an athlete in the sport, but help the sport grow. Think bigger than just being a competitive athlete, but be be a voice for what you do, helping other people, helping other athletes. Um, I think a lot of people don't do that. And that's where where the sport is lacking a bit in South Africa. And there's this handful of people that that does that and help individuals where they obviously see opportunities helping those athletes to to rise and and i think it's yeah that's sort of sweet but that's what i think is lacking in in our industry you still got a couple of years left in the fitness industry um i know you've got a couple of big ideas for yourself career wise where you where you headed in a couple of years time what are you busy with at the moment i competed now for the first time again in four years and it sparked a little bit of a flame in me again to to compete again um, I'll definitely be back on stage when it comes to being competitive. Um, then I have started my own fitness show two years ago. And um, I sold 
some of the rights to Australia. This is the runway for this, this model. For show. this runway for model, this runway South, model. Africa, yeah. South Africa. So my vision now is to to build this internationally, especially because I already had have somebody that's bought the rights for Australia. But um, yeah, I just really wanna I wanna build something very similar to to WBFF. Um, you know, I still got my love is still WBFF, and it will always be, and that's where I'll stay. But um, I think for for local for locally, our fitness industry need that. They need something where they can compete. It's, it's not a, it's, it's still a pageant. My main aim would be prize money. Um, I think that's why my show has done so well in the last two years because the, the prize money was pretty good. So instead of choosing to go in the direction of a federation, you're you're going more in the direction of bigger prize money, bigger, bigger prizes, prize money, yes. possibly even some kind of. Em- brand ambassador search a yeah. little later on yeah like giving them a handful of prizes after they competed at the show um, then currently also building our own media company where we've got where everything will be in-house on how to build an influencer and we'll have the videographers the editors the graphic designers the photographers everything under one roof I think that's a fantastic idea I think that with us constantly discussing and trying to give advice to you know, some of the local guys who are hungry for the same kind of success you've had, why not put yourself in a position where you can coach them yeah. or you can even manage them, become a management company where yeah. you can assist them in growing their social platforms, getting them brands behind them and pushing them into international expos yeah. to become the next Yaku de Brain. And then also started clothing again. So that's something that's that's up and coming but um, what's the clothing line going to be called it's going to be called ultimate but it's made by JDB clothing so it's, I'm still going to use my name or I'm going to use my name but my name won't be the visible thing on the clothing but it will be made by Yakuta brand clothing but every time there's a launch it will have a new name okay fantastic well, I think we, we're going to end it off there. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. You've been the first guy to uh, appear on the show, and uh, it definitely won't be the last time we're <laughs> going to have you on the show. I appreciate it, yeah. Thank you so much.